surrounded by hidden microscopic worlds filled with fascinating life forms. A handful of soil contains countless microbial creatures. On Pond Life, we're going on a safari to explore the microbial wildernesses that exist all around us. On this episode of Pond Life, we are on a field trip. We're about an hour and a half north of the city at the Mohonk Preserve. I am here with Michael Tesla from the American Museum of Natural History, and we're here to look for two things that we both really like, mosses and microbes. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Sally. I'm really excited to poke around on some rocks and some trees and look for lots of fun little mosses. Mosses are wonderful tiny plants, and they were also some of the earliest life forms to have colonized land. Moss are often the first to colonize a bare surface, like a rock or a tree trunk, areas where water and nutrients can be in short supply. Moss have adaptations that allow them to thrive in these environments, but they don't do it alone. They have microbes to help them out. All right, yeah, so let's check out some rock mosses. Oh, wow. So this one's a cool moss. This is Hedwigia. Mm -hmm. And if you take a little piece, and look at it under your hand lens, you'll see that a lot of it is see-through. Mosses are some of the most interesting looking things under the microscope. Well, of course I didn't come on this trip without bringing a microscope, so yeah. do you want to take a look? Definitely, let's do it. There's so many shapes and sizes and weird things going on with mosses that yeah. you know, you'd never know just looking at them when you walk by. Get some of these tiny little leaves off. have this phone adapter. Oh yeah, that's awesome. You can see the leaf cells, that's cool. Yeah. So this is the leaf and this is the leaf tip and you can see yeah, it's yeah. kind of see-through all the, all the cells. They don't have yep. uh, chlorophyll in there. Under the microscope, we can see just how thin a moss leaf is. Each consists of only a single layer of cells. These thin leaves can absorb water and nutrients directly from their surroundings, rather than having to transport water and nutrients from the soil through roots and shoots like larger plants. For these rock-dwelling species, this means they can soak up rainwater and even morning dew directly from the rock. Okay, so we're going up to 400 times magnification now. Yeah. And we'll take a look. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. So what are those little things? Yeah, they're just like little projections of the cell. And a lot of mosses have these weird little projections on the cell. Again, a lot of things that grow on rock have things like that. Okay. Um, in kind of these harsh environments that dry out or potentially get a lot of sun. These microscopic structures on the moss leaves might be playing a role in hydration, creating small channels and depressions to hold water. These spongy leaves also make an excellent environment for microbes, like these cyanobacteria, nestled here in the curve of a tiny leaf. So one of the other things that I want to do is try and collect a concentrated sample of microbes from this moss. So should we give that a go? Oh, definitely, yeah. So the microbes will be living on the moss and around the moss. And one of the ways we can attempt to concentrate them and kind of tease them out from the moss is to take a little bit of water and just kind of flush that water over the surface of the moss and pull it back up again into this pipette. Cool. And hopefully that way we will be able to trap some microbes. All right, so I can see lots of bacteria. Mm -hmm. As the moss grows, it sheds dead cells which are broken down by fungi and bacteria, over time forming a soil layer. The soil layer contains moisture and nutrients from the decomposed tissues, providing more habitat for more microbes. Cyanobacteria are here too. These photosynthetic bacteria can play an important role in this community. Their metabolic activity provides much needed nitrogen that the moss and the microbes can use. Here we go. Oh. What's this? Is that a ciliate? Or? That is a ciliate. Oh, yeah. very cool. Tiny wee one. Ciliates are single-celled predators that live by eating bacteria and other small microbes in the soil, this way contributing to the nutrient cycle. 
The diversity of ciliates we can find in this one patch of moss is astounding. Long ones, round ones, red ones, and even green ones packed full of symbiotic algae. So what's amazing, right, is that these organisms like ciliates, which need to be submerged in water to survive, mm -hmm. are able to make a living on something that dries out periodically yeah. like a moss. And one of the reasons they're able to survive is because they're so small. Mm -hmm. So even when this moss gets quite dry, there can sometimes be micro droplets of water around mm. its leaves. And a ciliate can survive quite a long time in a micro droplet of water. Not all the microbes here are single cellular. Some are tiny multicellular animals, and just like us, they come complete with a complex digestive system, including a mouth, stomach, and intestines. They even have small brains and simple nervous systems. This animal is a rotifer. Rotifers have a single foot at one end that helps with movement and attachment to surfaces. At the other end is a crown of cilia that funnels water and particles through the mouth and mastex. The mastex is a simple pharynx that moves the incoming particles through to the stomach. This is a nematode, a microscopic worm living here in the soil. Nematodes are some of the most numerous animals on Earth. Thousands can exist in a single handful of soil. One of the more charismatic microscopic animals is this one. This is the tardigrade, commonly known as the water bear or moss piglet. This tiny critter is a common resident of mossy soils where it sucks up food through a tubular mouth. Each tardigrade possesses four pairs of stubby legs complete with tiny claws. Though not exactly graceful, these legs and claws do help the tardigrade to move through its microscopic jungle home. Moss provides a habitat rich in food for these microscopic animals, all of which feed on bacteria or small microbes or moss cells. In return, their feeding activity contributes to the nutrient cycle in the soil adding to the breakdown of large organic molecules into smaller ones that can be reused by the moss and the wider community. However, when the moss dries out, these microscopic animals can dry out too. But like some of their larger relatives, they possess a thick outer cuticle which serves to protect their soft bodies from fluctuations in temperature and moisture levels. So what will happen is that when the moss completely dries out and the rotifers and the nematodes dry out too, they, they go into this dormant state where they just live as these inactive things. Mm -hmm. And then the next time it rains, they rehydrate yeah. and then they become active again. Which is basically what the mosses do. You can actually potentially have a 10 year old moss, put a droplet of water on and it'll start photosynthesizing immediately after that. Together, the activity of the moss and the microbes forms a thriving, balanced community. One that can make the most of many environments. Today we're not just here to look at the microbes and the moss through the microscope. We're also going to collect some of these mosses and take them back to the lab with us, where we're hoping to extract DNA from all the organisms that are living amongst the moss and use that DNA to help us identify what the different organisms are that make up this moss community. Thank you, sir. So we've been out and we've collected all of these moss samples because we're really interested in exploring this question of microbial diversity in association with moss. Some of this diversity we can see when we look through the microscope, but a lot of the time when we're looking through the microscope, we don't actually know what the species are that we're looking at. And we can only look at a really small amount of moss at a time. So to try and explore this question of microbial diversity in moss in more detail, we're going to use a technique called metabarcoding. Here's moss number one. Metabarcoding is this great technique where you can look at a uniform fragment of DNA across all of the organisms in your sample, and you can compare it to DNA sequences from known species and wind up with identification to the species level or at least the family level. Our process involves taking the moss and washing it through some sterile water, and that detaches all the microbes from the moss. We then take that water and we pass it over a really fine filter and the microbes get trapped on that filter. 
So that sounds kind of cool, but a little bit complicated. Why not just, you know, look at the moss itself? The problem is, if you just take moss and you put that through a DNA extraction protocol, you'll just end up with a ton of moss DNA rather than microbial DNA. So this water washing and filtering step helps to elevate the number of microbial sequences in our sample, so we sequence microbes rather than moss. So that filter gets taken and then put through a process to extract and concentrate DNA. And it's that DNA that we then send off for sequencing and then we get our sequences back and we can map them, as you said, and look at exactly what species were present in the moss. It was impressive to see how many microbial species were living on and around those moss samples. And that's something that's really understudied. Yeah, that's right. And I think that some of the work we're doing in the lab is hopefully going to increase our understanding of what microbial diversity is really like in a common moss. We still have so much to learn about microbes and microbial diversity. Through the microscope, we meet some of the more common species, while laboratory techniques like metabarcoding expand our ability to explore our planet's extraordinary microbial diversity.